we left the BSD conjecture hanging. The simple version was that for an elliptic curve, there are infinitely many rational points if and only if the central value is zero. The standard version of BSD is sometimes called the weak version, which is funny because this is the version that could give you one million dollars. It says that for any elliptic curve, the algebraic rank is equal to the analytic rank. So what is the algebraic rank of an elliptic curve? Elliptic curves are different from all other curves in that two points on the curve, say P and Q, can be added to produce a new point called P plus Q. Take the curve 14.A5 again. Recall that we found five rational points on this curve, these five. We can plot the equation E in a coordinate system. The graph consists of all the real solutions x, y to the equation, and some of these points may be rational points, meaning that x and y are both rational numbers. The five points in our table are seen here, 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 and here. Let's give them names. Say A, B, C, D, and E. To compute addition, there are two steps. First, find the third collinear point, and then find its vertical friend. For example, what is B plus C? Well, I draw a line through the points, the third collinear point is A, and then I move vertically to find the vertical friend, which is E. So B plus C equals E. Similarly, C plus D would be A. Every point has a unique vertical friend, except, and this is a little bit sad perhaps, but the point C is its own vertical friend. So, for example, A plus B is C. The lines we use, they will always have exactly three points, if you take into account uh, double points, triple points, and the so-called point at infinity, which we will call zero and which we imagine as being somewhere infinitely far away to the north. So, what is A plus D? Hmm. Where is the third point? Well, we have A, we have D, and then we have another copy of A here, because it's a double point. So the third point is A. The vertical friend then is E, so A, plus D equals E. Uh, B plus B. Well, the third point is also B. So B plus B, third point, B plus B is D. A plus E. Well, the third point now is zero, which also happens to be its own vertical friend. Actually, maybe zero and C could be friends with each other. Just not that kind of friend, you know, not vertical friend. Anyway, A plus E, that is zero. Why is the point at infinity called zero? Well, think about D plus zero. The third point then is B, so D plus zero is D. So this point does nothing 
when added on to some other point. Now, I have a plan. I will construct an infinite sequence of rational points. Then I will get infinitely many solutions. Right? A equals A. I'll just write that down in case I forget. Uh, 2A, by definition, is A plus A. A plus A means tangent line, third point is D, and the vertical friend is B. So 2A is B. 3A means 2A plus A. And now you can pause the video and, and do the rest. What we get is 3a equals c, 4a equals d, 5a equals e, and 6a, that is by definition 5a plus a, that is 0. And then 7a is a, 8a is 2a, and so on. I wanted infinitely many points, but that did not work. We are doomed to go round and round forever. When this happens, we say that the starting point A is a torsion point. If that does not happen, if we can keep going and going and never come back, we would say that the starting point is of infinite order. Let's take another curve, 37.a1, and start with the point, um, the origin. Call it A. Now, 2A is 1, 0. 3A is minus 1, minus 1. 4A is 2, minus 3. 5A now is 1 fourth and minus 5 over 8. We saw that one in the last episode. Finally, 6A is sort of far outside this page. It will be 614. And that one we also saw last time. With Sage, we can do this a lot faster. Now, we don't know, but it seems plausible that A is a point of infinite order. There is a theorem, the very important model veil theorem, which says that even though an elliptic curve may have infinitely many rational points, you can generate all of them starting from just a finite set. And by generate, I mean using addition and using vertical friend, which, if you think about it, is unary minus. Now, the question is, how small can you make this set? Like, is, is one point enough? Or do you maybe need seven to generate all the others? Well, that number depends on the elliptic curve. But it's known that for any given elliptic curve, you need at most two torsion points and then some number, say r, of infinite order points. And this, the number of infinite order generators, this number is called the algebraic rank of the elliptic curve. One more example. Check 91.b3 in the LMFDB. Here, you can see that 0, 06 is the only torsion generator, and minus 2, 3 is the only infinite order generator. So the algebraic rank in this case is 1. In abstract algebra language, the set of rational points is an abelian group, isomorphic to a torsion group plus a free group. And the algebraic rank, R, is the rank of the free part. Recall first that if you have an ordinary polynomial 
which has a zero at say three on the uh, x-axis, then that zero may look like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, and so on. These cases correspond to the factorization having a single factor x minus 3, or a double factor, or a triple factor, etc. If there is no factor x minus 3, then the graph doesn't touch the x-axis at 3, so it might look like this. We say that the polynomial has a zero of order 1, 2, 3, or 4, and visually, already order 2 and order 4 look quite similar. Order 4 is supposed to be flatter, so to speak, and order 6 would be even more flattened, etc. For an analytic function, like, for example, an uh, L function, the same principle is valid. Any zero has a specific order. Could be 1, 2, 3, for whatever. Visually, you can see the order from the graph, but that gets more difficult for very high orders. Okay, here is 37.a1. We just saw earlier that it has algebraic rank 1. Here is a curve of algebraic rank 2. And now, algebraic rank 3. And a curve of algebraic rank 4. Definition. The order of the L function at s equals 1 is called the analytic rank. In symbols, R A N for analytic is the order at s equals 1 of the L function L of s. And now the statement of the BSD conjecture finally makes sense. For any elliptic curve E, the algebraic rank equals the analytic rank. And this is mind-bending, because the L function and the analytic rank is constructed only from finite number systems, and I mean counting solutions mod p, while the algebraic rank comes from infinite number systems, in our case, the rational numbers. These two ranks belong in different worlds. What is known about BSD? A rough overview is that the BSD conjecture is known to be true for all curves of analytic rank 0 or 1, and also for some individual curves of analytic rank 2 and 3. For curves of high rank, nothing is known. Analytic rank 0 and 1, that was proved by some incredibly deep work, mostly by Viktor Kolivagin. And this is how happy you are if you can prove part of the BSD conjecture. In terms of general proofs that could work for a wide class of elliptic curves, my impression is that no one has any real idea of how to even begin. There is no strategy. It is like a fundamental barrier that we cannot transcend. A part of the problem is that there is an abelian group involved called the tate shafarevich group of an elliptic curve, or just Sha. This is conjecturally for every elliptic curve, a finite group, but this finiteness we cannot prove. When it comes to proofs for 
individual curves, there is another fundamental barrier, which is that when the algebraic rank is four or higher, the analytic rank is uncomputable with the current methods. We can plot the graph. It may look like, for example, rank four, as we saw, but in this case, we cannot prove that the analytic rank is actually four or something higher, even for a single curve. In all of this, the motivation for us is that in this chasm between what we believe is true and what we can actually prove, there are many clues to potential ingredients of F1 geometry. And today, before we end, I want to highlight three such pointers. But before we do that, I just have to mention two books. This one is a classic by Simon Singh. It's about elliptic curves and Fermat's last theorem, the history, the story of Andrew Wiles, and so on. Amazing book. The other one, I, I didn't know about this book until last week, and I don't have a physical copy. But it's again by Avner Ash and Robert Gross, same authors as the book we saw in a previous episode. This book is specifically about the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. It looks splendid. And to be honest, if you are only buying one book from all of these book recommendations, I would buy this one Elliptic Tales. When searching for a yet-to-be-discovered conceptual framework, still hidden in the darkness, there are different ways of listening for intimations of some fragments or some footholds that we could start working with. In the context of BSD, we will listen both to the existing proofs of known cases and also to these fundamental barriers that cry out for some completely new perspective. For the known proofs, some of the most important keywords are Euler systems and p-adic L functions. And Euler systems may come from Hegner points or from certain functions called Siegel units related to roots of unity. All of these should in some form be a natural part of F1 geometry and barring unexpected disasters we will eventually come back to all of these and a sphere of related ideas. So this is our first clue. Our second clue is the finiteness of the tate shafarevich group. There is a general philosophy of taking a flat scheme and a sheaf, usually a specific sheaf called GM or some generalized version of that, and producing a cohomology group. And these cohomology groups should explain or govern many of the patterns seen in L functions. Let's call this motivic cohomology, although later we will be more precise. The tate shafarevich groups comes from this procedure, and the general very, very deep problem is to prove that all such groups are either finite or finitely generated, like the group of rational points on an elliptic curve. So this finiteness problem for motivic cohomology is a clue. We may hope to replace flat schemes here, and probably the sheaves too, with some new objects from F1 geometry, such that this finiteness problem could be approached. 
The difficulty in this problem comes at least partially from the tension between collecting information from each prime number separately versus taking in the entire structure as a whole. The third clue will be the uncomputability of the analytic rank. The algebraic rank, we haven't talked about this at all, but it's known pretty well how to compute it. We seek a framework for L functions in which the analytic rank would also be computable. In our current understanding, computing analytic rank is an infinite computation in the following sense. Things boil down to proving that certain series of the form sum over all n of a n times f of n converges to zero, exactly. Here a n are the Dirichlet coefficients of the L function, and the f of n is some concrete expression. Here you can sum thousands of terms and get to maybe 0 0.01, and with millions of terms, maybe 0 0.000041, and so on. It looks like zero, but you cannot prove that the limit is exactly equal to zero. The F1 dream here is to find a framework in which such a computation becomes finite. Perhaps some combinatorial or algebraic or number theoretic computation that either proves that this number is zero or just gives you the analytic rank through some other means. Now, recall that the analytic rank is an element of L star, meaning that the analytic rank of a sum of L functions is just the sum of those two original analytic ranks. I will construct a sequence g1, g2, g3, also in L star, just to illustrate a few interesting points. Pick any L function L of s, define g of s to be the log derivative of L of s. That means L prime of s over L of s. The log derivative appears many places in number theory, one reason is that it transforms products of Dirichlet series to sums. Define g1 to be the first derivative of g evaluated at 2. So g here is some totally down-to-earth function, and g1 is simply the slope of that graph at the value 2. Define g2 to be the second derivative evaluated at 2, and so on. g3 is the third derivative at 2, etc. All of this works because L is analytic, meaning it has derivatives of any order. A tiny correction, I will put a minus sign in front of the odd derivatives, so at g1, uh, g3, g5, and so on. In one formula, gn is the nth derivative of g evaluated at 2 with this plus or minus sign factor. So each gn is a number that you can compute from any L function. Right, let's now take a um, rank 2 curve, algebraic rank 2, and compute the sequence g1, g2, g3, and so on. Here we use Pari GP embedded in Sage. This is the sequence. Now let's take a rank 3 curve. The sequence now looks like this. So I would like to think of this phenomenon 
as a sequence g1, g2, g3 in L star converging to a limit. And this limit is the analytic rank. I learned about this idea, like so many others, from my very good friend who is producing all the math content for these videos together with me. One surprising thing about this possible connection is that if you look at the L function graph again, the analytic rank is computed from this point, S equals 1 in the critical strip. But the invariants gn are computed from this point, s equals 2, which is in the region of convergence. The points I wanted to illustrate here are, first, thinking about elements of L star can be a useful perspective. And second, information about an L function from the mysterious critical strip can, in principle, be accessed already from the region of convergence. In this case, it looks like we could compute the analytic rank from a point in the convergence zone. Finally, here is a rank for example. It looks like convergence. And also, these threes appear not randomly, but at regular intervals. This is a rhythm. Three, three, four, 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 three, three, four.